morning, church. Happy Father's Day. There you go. You know, God has chosen. Uh, that's a, it's a God plan that we come into the world through families. And uh, I admit I don't always take as much pleasure or, or honor that as much as I should. And so I'm thankful for the opportunity today. And we say Happy Father's Day. And you, a lot of you say I'm not a father uh, for one reason or the other. Women probably say that. Uh, but, you know, you either are one or you had one. You know, that's God's way. And so we ought to be thankful for that. We don't always uh, have the best of experiences. Uh, we had a little reference to that earlier. But uh, God is a trustworthy father. And so if you've had a good experience in your earthly family, hallelujah. But if you haven't, and I think the word Mike used was you've been hurt, uh, this is a place of healing. It's a place to know that God loves us and we can learn new ways to relate with one another. And, and the relationship that uh, God has given us a male figure uh, in, in Christ himself, but uh, godly parents and godly fathers. So we're thankful for you here on this weekend. As you may have heard, I'm getting down to the, uh, the last couple of opportunities I have to preach, and that uh, weighs heavily upon me. It's, uh, well, let me do the math here for you. At the end of this month, when my work is completed and I enter into retirement, I will have been at this for 47 years. And that equates to 2,444 weekends. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of weekends. And uh, I didn't preach them all, of course, but I was in church almost each and every one of those in many services, lots of weekends. And then we were down to two this morning and then next week, Saturday and Sunday, is my last uh, time under appointment in the United Methodist Church as a witness for Christ uh, to do this in an official way. So that, what do you say when you, how many am I down to? Two, yeah, out of 2,444, uh, down to two. So what do you say to people when you're down to those last few things? Um, Rich preached some pretty hard stuff last week about uh, sexuality and what God's word says. And uh, today I'm going to preach something that's not quite as controversial as that, but it's probably just as important. It is about whether or not you have given your life to Christ. Every time I preach, I expect something to happen. I expect you to agree with me and say amen. Let's try it. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Uh, I expect you disagree with me. And we'll be quiet. <laughs> uh, I expect that you are wrestling with what we're talking about. What I don't ever want or expect is for you to just remain neutral. The proclamation of the word is to engage people that they are drawn to it or choose to be rejected by it, but not never to just stay unchanged. So my hope today is that you were aware of where you stand in your relationship with Christ, and that's what I'm going to work at. It can be taken as an affront. You know, when I was in college, I had never run into the aggressive evangelists that we had on campus there. Uh, they would come up to you, and they would put their bony finger right in your chest. And they would say, if you were to die tonight, will you know where your soul will go? Or words to that effect. You ever heard that? Uh, I was a Christian. I did know where my, but I was offended by that approach. I don't want to offend anybody. It's not my intention to put my bony finger in your chest this morning, even figuratively. But it is to say to you this morning, if you are at peace with this relationship you have with Christ, then all I hope you will say is amen. But if you are not yet certain of that, I hope today you will say yes to Jesus. And if you choose to reject this, I want you to know that the Bible teaches that there is a huge consequence. So that's my goal. Why do that today? Because I don't know how many more chances I'll get, and I want to be sure that you've heard me say this. So that's what we're going to do today. That's my intent. It's uh, my pleasure to be in front of you. And uh, I'm going to read a text in just a moment, from a brief text from Matthew's Gospel, just two verses. You've noticed if you've been with us regularly, we're not projecting the words anymore. We're kind of in an experiment. We want to see if you will bring your Bibles with you. Uh, it can be electronic form. Uh, I have one on my phone. You may have your iPad with you, whatever method. But we hope you'll do that. There's a cart back there. I can't see who's sitting back there. Uh, but if there's a cart back there that has Bibles on it, and you may borrow one, 
And if you need a Bible, take one. You know, if you find one back there you like, there are a couple different translations. Uh, you're welcome. We want to make sure everyone has easy access to a Bible. It's a good witness when you carry your Bible to church. You know, people see you carry your Bible and they say, I probably should do that. We ought to be comfortable with the Word of God, however it is we carry it. So we're not projecting that, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to see if we can change the culture a little bit about how we go about that. This comes from a part of Matthew's Gospel that's kind of collectively known as the Sermon on the Mount. When you go to seminary, uh, they teach you words like, this is one of the didactic sessions, one of the teaching sections. And I have no doubt there was a day that Matthew described when Jesus, with a big crowd around him, sat down, uh, which was the way a rabbi would teach, out in the open, and people listened, leaned in close, and Jesus began, blessed are they. You know, he did the Beatitudes. And then there are a lot of other very pithy little sayings of Jesus all clumped together through these next several chapters. I doubt that that's the way it happened exactly. I don't mean to doubt the word of God. I'm simply saying I think when the disciples uh, who were writing the Gospels, they collected material and they included it in appropriate places. So I don't know that every one of these things was said that day in this order. But I have no doubt that Jesus said all these things. And there are some things here that some people will say, oh, I don't like to hear that. One of, the, uh, one of the things I've noticed in my years of ministry that's changed, it, it may be just my observation, but I believe it's a fact. I believe it's true. Uh, I think people used to be more faithful to taking the whole gospel, reading and believing and trusting and being corrected by it, directed by it. But we have become a consumer culture par excellence. We like lots of choices. And so people have transferred that desire for consumerism into the way we do Bible study. And we, we choose what we like. And these are the things we believe. And these are the things we're not comfortable with. So I call it custom faith. Or maybe a better word is designer faith. You design your own faith, you know. We get to the place where we create God in our own image rather than being people who are created in God's image. And so I want you to be thoughtful about that today. Have you put together a faith pattern that suits you, including the things you like and excluding the things you don't? I don't think that's a good place to be. I think we have to say this is what the word of God says, and our lives need to be brought into parallel with that rather than us trying to bend God's will to our control. How often do we get up in the morning and say, God, bless the things I'm going to do today, rather than saying, God, show me what you would have me to do today. There's a big difference. Somebody has said, look and see where God's active and go join what's going on. So I, I want to put that out there just simply to say I don't mean to be uh, overly aggressive in my confronting you with this truth this morning, but I want to ask you the questions of who we are. Who are you? and collectively who we are. So this is found in Matthew chapter 7. It's only two verses, verses 13 and 14. It's in the midst of many other things that Jesus taught. And here's what Jesus said. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Pray with me a moment. Father, we pray for your continued presence in our lives. Christ, we thank you for the words which you spoke, revealing truth. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you draw near to us now in a way that allows us to engage the word that you've given. So, Lord, deal with us as we deal with you in Jesus' name. Amen. That's kind of an exclusive saying. You know, we live in a time of uh, we plurality. We like everybody to be treated fairly, and we want to make sure that everybody gets an equal chance. And so we've kind of moved to the place that surely God doesn't mean to exclude anyone. But this is what Jesus taught, and he taught it with language. We, there's, there could be a great word study here if you want to talk about why Jesus chose these images. They were appropriate in his time. I don't think that's really necessary. All we hear, need to hear Jesus say is, there is a narrow way, and it's not an easy way, but it's the way that leads to God. There's another way that it's much easier, but it doesn't lead to God. It leads rather, you remember the word? It leads to destruction. 
Do you like things to be easy? I do. You know, if there's an easy way to do something, I'm in favor of it. And uh, I sometimes spend more time trying to find an easy way than it would have been just to do it. You know, I don't know. My dad used to complain all the time. He said, if you just go do the work, you'd be done. You it's true. I think human beings like it to be easy and simple, and Jesus knew we had that propensity. And so I'm talking to you today kind of forcefully to tell you that if your faith doesn't change your behavior, if your faith doesn't change your choices, if the, the faith does not change your patterns in your life, your faith probably doesn't amount to much. It may not be a saving faith because once you say that you have come to believe in Jesus and you want to do it Jesus' way, I want to follow Jesus, it changes things. You can't keep doing all the things you were doing, and you need to start doing some things that you weren't doing. It's behavior modification because we now have a new role. We have a model to follow. We do it God's way, not our way. The designer faith would tell you it's okay to pick the ones you like, leave out the others. After all, don't all roads lead to heaven? Don't they? Well, not according to this book. The book says there's only one way into God's presence. There's only one name under heaven by which you may be saved. And no matter how much we would like to be inclusive of everybody and say everybody's a child of God, the Bible does not say that. It says we're all created in God's image, but we become children of God when we become people of faith. Read John's Gospel. He clearly states that. We're not born as children of God. We're born in the likeness of God. There's another place in Luke's gospel. This is not a unique moment that Jesus said that one time, and maybe somebody could say maybe we can ignore it. In Luke's gospel, I don't know if it was the same event, the same teaching, just retooled a little bit as Luke told this story. But if you turn to Luke chapter 13 and look at verses uh, 22 through 24, you will find a similar saying which lends weight, I think, to why I'm lifting this to you today. Let me read it to you. Uh, Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. It's Jesus talking. Jesus saying that the broad way is a dangerous way. It doesn't lead to where you want. If you find that your life of faith is no different than your life before faith, then I would suggest you're not on the narrow way. You have not entered through the narrow gate. You know, you can't bring a lot of baggage through a narrow gate. You have to lay it down. Say, I'm going to leave behind those things that were unworthy and unwholesome. I'm going to lay it down, and I'm going to follow now a new path. And let me tell you, that upward-twisting path is easier if you're not carrying the baggage that you brought with you to the gate. This is what I want to be sure I say to you. It's crucial that I clearly state that the way of faith is not easy. And again, I'll say it. If your faith demands little of you, your faith is probably of little value. We need to take these words of Jesus seriously, and that's my question to you. If you were to die tonight, is the way the uh, guys at my college said to me, I'll say it just another way. If you have accepted Christ, have you changed your life? Has it changed your habits? Has it changed your choices? Here's why that's important, who we are. This is not John speaking. I confirm it. I affirm it. I proclaim it. But it's not me saying it. It's what the Bible teaches. Who we are is we are saved or we're lost. Who we are is we are redeemed or we're unredeemed. Who we are is we're heaven bound. I, sorry. Heaven bound. And hell bound. No offense. You know, th there's only the two extremes. And Jesus said there is a broad path. And a lot of people are on it. That's a broad highway. It's nicely paved. And people are moving along at a brisk, brisk pace. But they're headed to destruction. So who we are, we are either saved or we're lost. I'm asking you that question this morning. I want to be sure you hear me say to you, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And moreover, have you begun a journey of faith that is transforming your life because of that choice? I hope you're saying internally, amen, because I have, or you're saying I need to do that and I need to do it today. Now, I'm going to say a little more about that in just a minute, but I want to go somewhere else for just a minute. And uh, Mike, you'd be so proud of me. Uh, 
we've been moving the last couple of weeks, and I'm sorry I'm dressed up today. But there's a baptism upstairs. Two young ladies want to be immersed. We had to drag in a big, big water trough. You might want to come up there at the end of the – we've never done that up there before. So I'm kind of dressed for that, but when we're moving, I'm wearing jeans with a big tear in the knee. <laughs> and, and my wife says, you look more and more like Mike. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to wear those one of these weekends, maybe next weekend. We've been talking about your individual faith, your life, the choice that you've made to be a disciple of Jesus, and I trust you've made that choice. And if you've not made it yet, I hope I can bump you over the edge today to say today is the day. But there's more to it than that. It's not just who we are individually, personally, as critically important as that is to each one of us. It's who we are as a church. What are we trying to accomplish here? What is our goal? What is our mission as a church? And I, I know this story from many, many years ago, and I've used it lots of different times, and I was kind of working on my own version, but I've decided it's probably better stated if I just read it to you and let you think a little bit about it. So here we go. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occurred, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut. And there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept constant watch over the sea, and with no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved, and various others in the surrounding area, wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought, and new crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped they felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for those who are saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and they put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it sort of as a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do the work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decorations. There was even a miniature lifeboat in the room where new club members were initiated. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. Some of them had black skin, some yellow skin. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where the victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to normal social life in the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives of those various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. You maybe have heard Pastor Rich say it. And by the way, we're so blessed to have Pastor Rich. You know, I, I don't know if you realize uh, how gifted he is. I've worked with pastors all my life, and if I could have chosen somebody uh, to come and be part of the team and then take the leadership of the team, I couldn't have found anybody uh, better than Pastor Rich Phipps. We are so blessed with his training, his heart for Jesus, his ability to have a vision for the future and see the steps that have to be taken. So when you see Pastor Rich, be sure to thank him for his faithfulness and his vision. I brought you as far as I know how to bring you. And I'm getting tired. The church is slowing up or speeding up and I'm slowing down, you know. So it's time. 
and you couldn't be in better hands to lead forward. And what has happened here in the last few years uh, with the staff, we have a great staff, we have great lay leadership, we have great lay members of this congregation, there's been a lot of conversation about our mission. And more and more we have realized it become crystallized, and again I thank Rich for his vision, that the church doesn't exist for those of us who are here. I mean, it's important what we do, and the, the things that we do here, none of them are bad or wrong, but it's not our mission. Our mission is for the people who are out there. You know that at least 70% of the people in Penn Township and the surrounding areas have no meaningful relationship with Christ. We're a life-saving station. Jesus said there will be a lot of people on the wrong road. Do you remember that? He said the way to faith, the way to a fullness of life is kind of a narrow gate and you, you have to work at it. It's something, it's a free gift of God, but if you're going to fulfill what God had intends for you, it changes your life. You're different than you were and the mission we have as individuals, who we are as individuals is to be saved. Who we are collectively is to see that others are too. We're to go out onto those perilous waters looking for those that will perish unless somebody throws them a lifeline. Do you know anybody in deep water? Do you know anybody's life that's a shambles? Do you know anybody that doesn't have a clue about which end is up and what is right and what is wrong? It's not hard to find them. They're everywhere, about 70% of the population. doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means that they haven't found the way that you've found because you're here today. So that's, that's what I'm trying to encourage you to think about today. My hope is today that you recognize that's our business. You know, John Wesley founded the Methodist movement that became many denominations, including our United Methodist Church. And he told his preachers as that denomination was forming, he said, you have one job. The way he put it in Old English was, you have not to do but to save souls. That's our work. That's what we do. That's who we are. And if we're not doing that, I don't know who we are. I don't know what we're doing. We're building a great new building. Have you noticed? Have you seen the glass out front? It's really beginning to take shape. It's so exciting. Man, I feel like Moses. I can see the promised land, but I'm not going in, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really love what we're doing here. But we're not doing it to have a great building. We're doing it to provide a place that will be appropriate for the area where we live and the time in which we live that people will feel willing and attracted and safe to come here. And when they do, we want to offer them Jesus. Our role here is not to have a cool, beautiful building. That's a tool that we will use to bring many, many others to a saving faith in Christ. So that's my role here today. Amen. Thank you. Uh, my role here today is simply that who we are individually, saved. And if not saved, troubled. What do we say of our church? Who are we collectively? My father, who was a pastor, was not given to, well, how should I put it? He was very serious about his faith, and he encouraged his children to be serious. We were not always as serious. He often admonished me about taking lightly things of faith. One day, we were driving down over the Pleasantville Mountain, Route 56, that goes from Richland Township down toward Bedford. And there's a great vista. You can see forever. It's beautiful. That day it was overcast, low overcast, heavy clouds. Everything was dark. And down in the valley there was a hole in the clouds and there was a shaft of sunlight shining down on a farm. And it was all lit up. And it really was quite a st stunning contrast. And my father, who was pretty serious about his faith, said, hmm, wonder who lives there. I think that needs to be us. You know it's dark around here. 70% of the people have no meaningful relationship with Christ. I would trust that there's a hole in the clouds above and there's a shaft of light coming down on this place, drawing people's attention that they will come here and that they will understand the importance of honoring God by turning to God in faith. So we close the message this morning this way. I'm going to pray this pr sinner's prayer, a form of the sinner's prayer. If you are a Christian, you can just pray it saying, Lord, I still give my heart to you. If you've never prayed this prayer, you can now enter into a new relationship with Christ today simply by meaning the words that you say when you speak the words quietly to yourself or out loud as you wish. 
The words that I'm going to share with you again as giving my heart again to Christ and inviting you to do the same. Will you bow in prayer with me? Loving God, this day I acknowledge I am a sinner in need of your grace, that I am unable to save myself. You alone are Lord. I offer my life to you today in my case again, praying that you will continue to be patient with me and extend your mercy to me, that I might give my heart to Christ and begin to learn to walk in that narrow way, being disciplined and focused and transformed. So Lord, we pray today collectively, and I pray individually, that you will once again receive my life through what Christ has done and that I am no longer seen in my sin but seen through Christ as one who is forgiven. Lord, continue to allow me to follow Jesus in whose name I pray. Amen.